So um, this is a joint work with um, Rafael de la Llave and uh, Terra Sara. So I'll start uh, with, a, with an introduction, with a motivation to the problem. So the motivation is to start uh, um, the stability of uh, small perturbations of integrable Hamiltonian systems. So um, let's suppose that we have uh, this time-dependent uh, uh, Hamiltonian system. So um, uh, you have a part of the Hamiltonian, the which is integrable, and so depends on a uh, 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 variable i. And you have a perturbation um, which is depends on all variables. So let me explain a little bit what are all of these variables. So I phi are essentially, are called action angle variables and uh, essentially are uh, uh, polar coordinates uh, that are compatible with uh, uh, the natural symplectic structure of the system. And uh, a variable T is the time, so which is periodic. So um, if you let the the um, equations of motion, the Hamilton's equations of motion corresponding to this Hamiltonian are uh, written over here. So they are uh, relatively simple. So if the perturbation epsilon is uh, set equal to zero, so what you have is that in the first equation, uh, I dot is equal to zero, so the uh, action is fixed, so the radius is fixed. And then phi dot is given by some uh, um, number which depends uh, only on i. So this is the frequency of the motion. So essentially what happens is that you have uh, uh, the, the phase space of the system. It's foliated by invariant tori. Each uh, torus correspond, corresponds to a fixed value of the action i. And the motion uh, on each torus happens with some uh, fixed frequency. So. Um, this is a very uh, old uh, problem, so it was uh, motivated in the works uh, of Poincaré in celestial mechanics. So uh, one understands, of course, uh, very well what happens if you have no perturbation, but the question is uh, uh, what happens if you add a small perturbation to the system. And there are uh, many type of uh, questions that uh, one could ask, so I have here uh, uh, some some of the possible questions. So the, the main question is that for uh, generic perturbation H1 and for all sufficiently small perturbations, the system has trajectories that travel widely and arbitrarily far. So uh, I'll try to uh, explain a bit what all of these uh, uh, words in quote mean. So, well, generic, uh, generic uh, can mean uh, basically different things. So sometimes you want um, H1 to be in an open, dense set of functions relative to some uh, smooth, uh, some function space which can be smooth of some regularity of or analytic. Or uh, it can be uh, something more complicated, which is uh, the uh, uh, concept of cast residual, which was uh, introduced by Professor Mather. So arbitrarily far is essentially that you find trajectories such that the change in the action variable over time at some point is bigger than some constant, which is independent of the size of the perturbation. And uh, widely means that if you fix in the action space uh, um, a finite collection of open, non-empty sets that are pairwise disjo disjoint, you should be able to find trajectories that land at different times in uh, one of these sets in the uh, collection. So basically this is uh, uh, what sometimes people call symbolic dynamics. The idea is that you prescribe these sets and uh, there are trajectories that move in the prescribed order. So uh, let me uh, also make this remark. So this is a time-dependent uh, Hamiltonian system. So the, ener the total energy is not preserved for such a system. But you can um, 
easily convert such uh, a time-dependent uh, Hamiltonian into an autonomous Hamiltonian by adding an extra variable, for example, A, which is uh, conjugate with the time. So now uh, A, T are like uh, uh, action angle variables. So, and uh, for this one, of course, that uh, the total energy is preserved. So you will be asking a similar type of questions for a fixed energy level. So uh, some related, so the main question is uh, existence of uh, these orbits that travel arbitrarily far or uh, travel in a chaotic uh, fashion. And there are uh, lots of uh, sub-questions, so related question is uh, sometimes, uh, particularly if you are interested in applications, you want to find uh, uh, explicit conditions both on the uh, integrable part or on the perturbation. So these are conditions that uh, uh, can be verified in concrete examples. Of course, that you want them also on generic type that guarantee the existence of diffusing orbits. Or, so by diffusing orbits, I mean orbits that travel a large distance uh, with respect to the action. Um, you also, again, with an eye to applications, you'd like to find explicit mechanisms of diffusion. So you want to find what are the pa several possible pathways that uh, diffusing, diffusing orbits can take. You would be also interested in to estimate uh, the rate of diffusing orbits uh, as a function of uh, the perturbation epsilon. And um, there are some other questions which uh, ask the existence of trajectories uh, whose projections onto the uh, action space are asymptotically dense. So basically it means that you give yourself a delta and uh, you find uh, trajectories such that the delta closure of the whole orbit is the whole space. And uh, there are also uh, important questions to find or construct examples which exhibit diffusion and maybe you want some, some additional feature either on the diffusing orbits or on the particular examples that, that you are interested in. So uh, when one uh, wants to prove the, the, the existence of diffusing orbits, one has to battle several daemon, daemons, and I'm, I'm just going to list a few of them. And uh, well, there are many others, and uh, they, they work together very well against you. So, so basically, one of the uh, intrinsic problem of such systems in the, in the general case is that if you find diffusing orbits, these uh, are going to be extremely slow. So there are these Nehoroshev uh, estimates that tell you that um, uh, you can only diffuse at an exponentially uh, slow rate with respect to Yeah, so I think this is, uh, yes. Which one? Yes, yes, yes. So I think yes. Yes. So, so a long time to you, you want for and then you, you want the P? Uh, well I'm not quite sure on that. No, I think it's the signs are uh, uh, the the signs are reversed. So. Numbers. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> My numbers are negative. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so <laughs> yes. So the, the change in action should be very very small, very small for a very long time. And um and this constant A and B depend on N, and uh, the Nehoroshev formulation was for uh, analytic Hamiltonians, and mm -hmm. uh, there are also similar estimates for uh, finitely differentiable uh, Hamiltonians by, by Bunemura, but there are also some uh, um, similar type of estimates in the infinite dimensional case by Burgen. So another daemon that you, you have to face is that there are some obstacles, many several types of obstacles uh, against diffusing orbits. So uh, of course, that uh, the uh, well-known one are the uh, KM tori. So as I said before, when the perturbation epsilon is set to zero, you find that the whole phase space is foliated by invariant tori. And uh, the uh, KM theorem says that um, uh, under some uh, conditions, uh, which are generic on the um, on the in 
on the integrable system and under some smoothness conditions, most of the tori from the integrable case survives to, survive to the perturbation. And by most, we can uh, measure in um, those are the tori that have uh, Diophantine frequency, uh, frequencies, which <coughs> are uh, frequencies that are badly approximated by, um, by rational numbers. And uh, I mean, this is uh, uh, a little bit an, uh, not very precise type of statement because the, the conditions that you put on the tori that survive the perturbation also depend on the smoothness of the systems. And um, so when n equal to 1, so if you, uh, the, the KM tori actually uh, separate the, the phase space, so you can actually have no diffusion, so you can think in terms of what, of what happens in the autonomous Hamiltonian system associated to that one. So uh, that, is, that is a two degrees of freedom Hamiltonian system. An energy manifold is uh, three-dimensional and the uh, uh, KM tori are two-dimensional, so you are going to have geometric separation of the energy manifold by two-dimensional tori. So you cannot, simply you cannot cross. So you, so, um, uh, so another problem is that uh, uh, this system, um, this type of system have uh, resonances. So uh, resonances mean that you have uh, uh, for certain uh, values of the action, uh, you have the frequency uh, satisfying a, a resonant condition and uh, uh, you have uh, infinite number of, of resonances and then these can also uh, work against you. So Yes. Aren't they your friends too? Yes. So in <laughs> so in both mechanisms, uh, the the KM and the resonances can work for you and can work against you. So one of the question, uh, at, let's say at an uh, intuitive level, is that if we have uh, many KM tori and many resonances, if you add them all together and you take closures of these sets, whether there are some true obstacles that you cannot ever cross. So. Um, so uh, in order to um, uh, describe uh, a little bit uh, in more detail the type of the problems that uh, um, uh, I want to refer to, let me just introduce some, some uh, or recall some terminology. So let's suppose that we talk about uh, orbits of a Hamiltonian flow. Uh, for example, let's say we have lambda closed orbit. We say that such an orbit is hyperbolic if if you cut this uh, closed orbit by a, surf by a local surface of section and you compute the return map to this surface of section, the, the return map has no eigenvalue of modulus equal to 1. So basically, if you look at the return map relative to a surface of section, you are going to see that uh, you have a saddle point with uh, unstable direction, some direction that takes you away, and a stable direction that takes you towards. And uh, if you sort of move this uh, surface of section along the closed orbit, you are going to find stable and unstable manifolds for the whole closed orbit. And now in this picture, I'm going to, uh, I'm depicting lambda as a point. So the unstable manifold is the red curve and the uh, stable manifold is the blue curve. So in the red curve, the unstable and the stable intersect. So the intersection is a, an orbit that is referred as a homoclinic orbit. And if this intersection uh, is transverse, a uh, very classical result says that um, there are infinitely many homoclinic orbits that are uh, geometrically different, but the, there is also a hyperbolic set on which you have chaotic dynamics. So uh, we'll need this uh, 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 very well-known result later on. So uh, some other geometric objects that, that we need are uh, um, a normally hyperbolic invariant manifold and the concept of a scattering map. So a normally hyperbolic invariant manifold is essentially, imagine that you have the, the previous picture, but instead of having a hyperbolic orbit, you replace that orbit by a whole manifold, and we can have more complicated uh, dynamics on that manifold. So in the normal directions to that manifold, 
you are going to have uh, an unstable bundle along which you have uh, exponential expansion and a stable bundle along which you have exponential contraction. In the manifold itself, you have some dynamics, but the rates at which you have dynamics along the normally hyperbolic invariant manifold are dominated by the normal direction. So this is uh, what is known as a normally hyperbolic invariant manifold. So now let's assume that you have a um, lambda, a normally hyperbolic invariant manifold, and you have that the stable and unstable manifold of lambda intersect uh, along a homoclinic manifold. So there are many homoclinics, but you fix one of them. So uh, now uh, one can define the so-called um, uh, scattering map. So imagine that uh, you fix a point x in the homoclinic manifold, and um, these stable and unstable manifolds of lambda come with foliations. So you have a, a foliation of the unstable manifold by unstable fibers of points, and you also have a foliation of the stable manifold by stable fibers of points. So if you fix your homoclinic, and if you cut it if necessary, uh, for each uh, x in the homoclinic intersection, you find precisely uh, one unstable fiber, and let's call the foot point x minus and uh, one stable fiber. Let's call the foot point x plus. So the scattering map takes x minus to x plus. So this is a map which is defined on lambda, or to be more precise, on some subset of lambda in general. So it's, this, it's a map on the uh, 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 normally hyperbolic invariant manifold and is associated to a particular choice of a homoclinic manifold, which is uh, cut in some way in order to make this map, the scattering map, uh, local diffeomorphism. Uh, well, the idea of diffeomorphism from e e its domain to its range in lambda. So um, this is a geometric device, but it's also computable in concrete examples. So people use uh, Poincare, Melnikov types of computation to uh, estimate the changes of the scattering map relative to lambda. So um, there, there are uh, one of, well, there are many nice properties, but one of them that it's important to us is that if you are in a symplectic context, if your manifold M uh, is um, symplectic and the, if the restriction of the symplectic form to lambda, the normally hyperbolic invariant manifold, it's also symplectic. And if the map is symplectic, then the, the scattering map is also symplectic. So, um, and again, I will use this ingredient uh, later on. So now I'm going back to uh, the uh, problem of Arnold diffusion, saying that uh, you expect the generic perturbations of integrable Hamiltonian system to have trajectories for which the action changes by some constant independent of epsilon. So uh, there is a classification by uh, Kierke and Galavotti, which uh, says that uh, you can look at several classes of uh, such Hamiltonian systems. So one class is called um, the a priori stable. So when the unperturbed system can be expressed in terms of action angle variables only, so this was uh, exactly the formulation of from the first slide. There is uh, the a priori unstable case, which is in some sense easier. So in the unperturbed system, you already allow to have some hyperbolicity, and we will show an example of that. And uh, there is an even let's say, easier case, the a priori chaotic case, uh, in which uh, the unperturbed system not only that has hyperbolicity, but it has some chaotic, uh, chaotic hyperbolic set. So, so the, the difference between uh, the second and the third case is that maybe in the, imagine that you have a, a pendulum, and uh, in the second uh, case, so you have a pendulum for which the stable and unstable manifolds coincide. And when you apply the perturbation, these stable and unstable manifolds uh, do split, and you create a hyperbolic chaotic set that way. But uh, in the a priori chaotic case, you already have this uh, hyperbolic set 
before you apply the perturbator. So this makes the problem somewhat easy. And uh, uh, there, uh, uh, so th this problem dates from 1964, and there are many, many results, and there are many methods, and I'm going to uh, cite variational methods, uh, geometric topological methods, also some hard analysis type of methods, and um, I'm also uh, listing, uh, I mean, I'm just saying that there are uh, numerous numerical approaches, and there are, uh, I mean, all of this is a very, very short list of, uh, of references. The, the, I mean, there are actually hundreds of references, to say the least, so I'm just uh, putting here some, some of them. And there are um, positive results and uh, uh, announcements in, in uh, um, all of these directions. And the hardest of the problems is the a priori stable case, uh, where uh, there are recent announcements by, by Professor, Professor Mather, um, uh, by uh, Kaloshin and collaborators, and so on. Yes, and, and I'll, I'll mention that. So uh, these are the, uh, the main results that uh, I would like to uh, discuss today. So, so I'll start with the um, shadowing lemma for normally hyperbolic invariant manifolds. So this is going to be a relatively simple but extremely useful result that can be applied to all three cases. And uh, then I will uh, show the existence of diffusing orbits for a model of an a priori chaotic system. And this model is precisely, you have a geodesic flow on a compact manifold with a generic metric, which can be Riemann, Kingsler, or Lorentz. And uh, you apply some time-dependent perturbation. And on the time-dependent perturbation, you ask for some mild recurrence condition, which will be made very precise. And the question of instability in this case is that whether there exist trajectories whose speed or energy goes to infinity in time. So for the a priori unstable case, so um, I will uh, um, show an example, which is essentially you have a mechanical system consisting of a number of rotators and a number of penduli with a small uh, time-dependent periodic coupling. And we show that there exist trajectories for which the action a variable changes by order one with respect to the perturbation epsilon. And uh, I'm also uh, working with uh, um, uh, Derayave and uh, Sarah on uh, the a priori stable case. And uh, the, the main idea is that uh, this shadowing lemma uh, uh, seems to be very useful to, to, to give a, a positive answer in even in that situation. So, um, so let me uh, state uh, this shadowing lemma that, uh, as I said, uh, I think is very useful. So we are in the context described before. So you have a, a manifold with a map. So we are in some uh, low regularity class like uh, C2. And I have a normally hyperbolic invariant manifold for the map. And there is a, so we have stable and unstable um, manifolds of lambda, and you assume that these stable and unstable manifolds intersect transversally, and you have a homocleaning manifold. And the homocleaning manifold is uh, uh, in such a way that the scattering map, which was described uh, before, it's well-defined. So um, now uh, you give yourself a small quantity, a delta, and the statement is the following. So there is some n sufficiently large, such that every time you pick a pseudo orbit, so of the following type, so you apply the, you take the point, you take a point in lambda, you apply the inner dynamics for a long enough time, then you apply the scattering map, and then you apply the inner dynamics, that is the dynamics restricted to lambda, for again for a long enough time. So this is not a true orbit, this is a pseudo orbit. So if you have such a pseudo orbit, then uh, there exists a true orbit of the system 
uh, which follows the pseudo orbit um, very closely. So let me explain this uh, a bit. So the scattering map is not dynamically defined. So it's a geometrically defined map. So there is no trajectory that goes to x minus 2x plus because these fibers are not invariant. So if you start with a homoclinic point and you iterate it backward in time, what you will see is that uh, the inverse image of this approaches the inverse image of x minus. And the forward image of this approaches the forward image of x plus. So the true orbit, it's uh, asymptotic backwards in time to the inverse image of x minus as is asymptotic forward in time to the uh, forward image of x plus. So uh, the, the uh, shadowing lemma that uh, it's stated over here says that uh, suppose that you have lambda and uh, suppose that you are able to start with a point in lambda, apply the uh, inner dynamics From here, you apply the scattering map. And then you apply the um, inner dynamics again. So what you have is really you have a piece of a homoclinic orbit which is associated to the scattering map and a piece of the inner dynamics. So these two do not make a true orbit. There is some room. One of them is above, figuratively speaking, uh, above lambda, and the other one is containing lambda. So this is uh, uh, a pseudo orbit is not a true orbit. But if you are able to find such a pseudo orbit, then there is a, a true orbit uh, nearby. And um, to prove that, one can uh, do a proof in several ways. And uh, one possible way to do it is using some uh, topological tools, uh, which, uh, for example, correctly aligned windows. So this is, uh, briefly speaking, I mean, it's uh, some version of Conley index theory. Uh, it's, it's, you can think of it as a f version of the Conley index theory. So, uh, so I'm not going to prove that, but uh, uh, let me emphasize that, uh, of course, there is a strong assumption in, in this theorem, namely that you, you should be able first to find such a pseudo orbit. So the, 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 the embedded assumption is that such a pseudo orbit exists, but once you find it, uh, you are able to find a true orbit nearby. So now, um, this is a, an application of that, so it's again in an abstract situation, but uh, later on I will give an example of how can this be applied. So um, assume that uh, the scattering map preserves a measure absolutely continuous with respect to, to the Lebesgue measure. So if you are in the symplectic case, this comes for free. And now assume that you are able to uh, apply the scattering map, the geometric map, again and again. So you take a point x0 and you apply the scattering map you end up at x1, and you apply the scattering map again, and you end up at x2, and so on. And also, you assume that each point on this orbit of the scattering map has a neighborhood which contains a full measure set of recurrent points. So uh, if this happens, you, there exists a true orbit of the system whose points are close to the uh, points of the orbit of the scattering map. So, um, and the basic idea is that if you, are, if you are able to make progress with a scattering map by applying it again and again and again, uh, then the recurrence property allows you to construct a, a pseudo orbit that uh, of the type indicated before, which uh, follows closely this orbit of the scattering map. And then if you find such, such a pseudo orbit, then you find the true orbit uh, by the previous lemma. So basically, uh, 
uh, one can use the uh, Poincaré recurrence theorem to uh, ensure that you have uh, plenty of recurrent points and you can use these recurrent points to, to uh, find uh, trajectory. So in order to apply this theorem, so you'll need uh, basically two things. So you'll need the existence of uh, many recurrent points. So if your map is area preserved, if your map is uh, symplectic, if your scattering map is symplectic, uh, you are uh, you are just fine, and uh, the other uh, uh, condition that is part of this statement is that you should be able to find a path by which, if you apply the scattering map repeatedly, you are able to make progress in the in a direction that you are interested in. So when will when this uh, result is applied to concrete examples, so what you want to do, you want to be able to produce perturbations of the integrable Hamiltonian for which the corresponding sc uh, scattering map. So for this perturbation, you should be able to find homoclinic manifolds for the which the corresponding scattering map uh, allows you to increase the action variable by order one. And then if you find a direction in which the scattering map changes the action variable by order one, then you apply this type of result and you find true orbits that have changed by order one. So the moral of the story, and uh, we are going to see another version of, of this moral, is that uh, a little recurrence goes a long way. So basically, let me put it another way. So you have this scattering map that it's the main vehicle to, to change the action uh, coordinate in your system. And you pretty much do not care what is going on in the dynamics restricted to lambda. All you need to, to do is have some recurrence that allows you to, if you are at a point, the recurrence should allow you to come back at a nearby point and use the scattering map again. So it's a mechanism in which this scattering map plays the fundamental role and the dynamics restricted to lambda to the normally hyperbolic manifold is. Uh, so, so far you're assuming all this is true, right? Yes. But, uh, Yes, so, uh, but I'm just saying, so imagine that, uh, let me just give a quick example. So imagine that your lambda is, so lambda is uh, a two-dimensional annulus. So if you have uh, two invariant tori, So if your inner map is um, area preserving, so basically uh, this condition is um, automatically satisfied. You exist, you have uh, all points are recurrent. And then what you have to find in order to apply this theorem, you should be able to find uh, a scattering map such that If you apply the scattering map repeatedly, you get uh, far. You change the action variable by by, by large distance. <coughs> so now, uh, so the I'm just uh, mentioning. Uh, this result uh, without proof, and I'll concentrate on the uh, second result when you have a uh, perturba time dependent perturbation of a geodesic flow on a compact manifold. So, uh, this is the, the setup for the problem. So, you have a compact manifold uh, uh, with a metric which is CR smooth. So. Uh, R can be very low, so we think that uh, R greater than or equal to 5 is enough, but uh, one can do per perhaps even better than that. And the metric can be Riemannian or Fisler or Lorentz. And there are going to be some uh, conditions on the metric that uh, are uh, explicit on the uh, next slide, and um, uh, those conditions are also generic. So now you consider the geodesic flow on this manifold and you apply an external perturbation by a potential. 
So the external perturbation is driven by some uh, other dynamical system. So you take another manifold N, and you have some flow, which is perhaps, let's just say, associated to a vector field on this external manifold. You uh, start as a parameter with an initial condition on this external manifold, and uh, you flow it away. And then you have a coupling between the geodesic flow, so this part of the Hamiltonian represents the geodesic flow, and this is a potential which depends on Q on the uh, position a coordinate on the original manifold and also depends on the location where you are on the external manifold. So at different times, you're going to be at different locations on this external manifold that act as a driver. And so you have a time-dependent Hamiltonian, which also depends on a parameter. This is the initial point on this external manifold that acts as a driver. So I want to uh, argue that um, there exist solutions for which the energy uh, grows to infinity in time. So let me uh, explain one more thing. So the geodesic flow can always be realized uh, as a Hamiltonian by choosing the Hamiltonian equal to the uh, kinetic energy. So this H0 really means the kinetic energy, and it gives you the geodesic flow. So uh, I'm going to make some assumptions on the geodesic flow. So uh, the assumptions are the following. So um, there exists a closed geodesic that is hyperbolic in the unit tangent bundle. And um, the stable and unstable manifold of this uh, closed geodesic have a transverse intersection, again, in the unit tangent bundle. So these are essentially assumptions on the metric that uh, for which you have the geodesic flow. Now, uh, let me put some um, assumptions on the external dynamical system that acts as a driver. So. Uh, a simpler condition would be that the flow on this external dynamical system is minimal, meaning that uh, each uh, orbit is uh, dense. But uh, we can actually consider a, um, a weaker assumption, namely that the flow has a, a uniformly recurrent point, which is non-trivial. So a uh, uniformly recurrent point is a recurrent point with uh, uh, bounded return times. And uh, it is known that if you have a compact manifold with a flow on it, there is always a uniformly recurrent point. But it can be a fixed point. So what we require here is that there is such a uniformly recurrent point which is non-trivial. And uh, we are going to have slightly different statements for the existence of uh, trajectories of the perturbed geodesic flow that for condition A3 and condition A3 prime, you are going to have slightly different results. So let me point out that uh, the conditions A1 and A A2 on the metric that uh, produces the geodesic flow have been shown to be uh, generic conditions by, uh, by Contreras. And the, uh, they are also known to be uh, generic uh, for Finsler metrics. And it seems like for, for Lorentz metrics, uh, they should also be uh, generic, but we could not find an, an exact statement. So um, one of the, uh, why do we care about uh, Lorentz metrics, for example? So, uh, so these are metrics with, with sign and uh, once you have a metric <coughs> wi with sign, uh, typical uh, variational approaches uh, do not work. So we just wanted to emphasize that the geometric uh, methods uh, work anyway. So now these are the two statements. So recall that uh, assumption A3 says that uh, you have at least one uniformly recurrent point that is non-trivial, and A3 prime is that the flow is minimal. So. Uh, for the first statement, you fix, you actually pick an initial condition for this external flow. And actually, uh, to be more precise, you really pick the uh, uniformly re recurrent point, which is non-trivial. And then once you made this choice, uh, there is a, a generic set uh, of potential phi, and there exist trajectories. 
such that uh, the energy along trajectory grows uh, faster than linear. And um, the second statement is that if you assume that the flow is uh, minimal, you don't really have to choose the initial condition on this external uh, uh, perturb driver of the system. Any point in this external dynamical system will work. And you are always finding uh, trajectories for which the energy grows uh, at a linear rate with respect to time. And uh, first, let me point out that uh, linear growth of the energy with respect to time is um, optimal. And this can be easily uh, shown by a, by a simple computation. So if you take the derivative of the energy along a trajectory, you find out that it depends on the derivative of v and on the vector field. And if you have compactness, then this is a bounded quantity. So it gives you a linear rate. But let me uh, emphasize. Um, Um, uh, probably yes. So uh, uh, we, this is something that we haven't done. So, but through this, uh, because the, the the method that we do is uh, constructive, yeah, probably if we work hard enough, we can uh, say something about the Hausdorff uh, dimension of of such trajectories. But let me emphasize uh, something uh, about this type of statement. So the the. The external dynamical system is uh, only required to satisfy a mild recurrence condition. So it doesn't have to be periodic. It doesn't have to be quasi-periodic. So once you uh, come up with an example of something that is not periodic or quasi-periodic, you cannot at least immediately apply uh, classical tools such as the KM theorem does not work. You cannot apply uh, uh, variational methods. You cannot apply. Um, Averaging, at least in, in the classical form. So um, the second statement is that uh, you can also get uh, symbolic dynamics. So you can give yourself uh, a path in the energy space, and you can closely follow this path. So you find trajectories that uh, follow uh, such a path uh, within some margin of error. So let me say that. Uh, if you go back and choose your uh, external uh, manifold to be <coughs> a, a torus and the flow, a linear flow on the torus, if you assume that uh, the frequency of this flow is uh, uh, irrational, you do not need to assume di Diophantine, as in the works of uh, Del Sam, De Ave, and Sarah. You still get the existence of, of uh, trajectories whose energy grows to infinity in time. And in the case when d is equal to 1, you recover the case of time periodic perturbation. And uh, these are some examples. So we essentially, you can take any, as a driver, you can take any external dynamical system that has some, uh, some minimal dynamics. So you can take, uh, there are several examples of uh, minimal or a cycle flows that you can use or a close and homogeneous spaces. So, uh, and the point in this example is that they do not have a frequency of motion. So once you do not have a frequency of motion, some of the uh, classical uh, tools to find uh, trajectories like that do not work. Well, if you have drivers like that, they should be better prepared than if you have people who can Yes, intuitively. But on the other hand, so uh, th these examples are not uh, very crazy, so to speak. So they are still uh, relatively tame. So uh, uh, if you start to consider an external dynamical system that is very wild, so it really helps you with the diffusion. So, so these examples that I showed before are uh, not extremely wild, but uh, they do not have a frequency of motion. So uh, I'm going to skip some of the some of the comments here and. Uh, just say that uh, the conditions that for this theorem, the conditions that we have on the on the potential are explicit, and also uh, the method of constructing orbits whose energy grows to infinity are also quite explicit. So they can be implemented in uh, 
in practical uh, uh, examples, for example, uh, you can think of the problem of uh, taking uh, a satellite around the Earth and use the uh, quasi-periodic perturbations by the moon and the sun to take the, this or satellite orbit and uh, change the inclination of it at uh, zero cost or something. So, yes. So uh, the um, the Kepler problem, if you regularize collision, it's a geodesic flow on a, on a electrosphere. So it's by Moser. So um, this is a, a statement uh, on applying um, uh, this, this shadowing lemma to a priori unstable system. So this time you have an integrable system plus a collection of penduli and a small perturbation. So this is a, a priori unstable in the sense that if when epsilon is equal to zero, you have the uh, really integrable case plus something that gives you hyperbolicity into the system. So you make uh, some uh, uh, assumptions. So some one assumption is that uh, you have some regularity, which is, uh, doesn't have to be too large for all of these functions. The potential has to be uh, really the potential associated to, to a pendulum. So these are some conditions that there exists a separatrix, and a trajectory that corresponds to the stable and unstable manifold of the hyperbolic fixed point. And uh, on H1, on the perturbation, we ask some conditions that some explicit non-degeneracy conditions that uh, depend on evaluating H1 along homoclinic orbits in the unperturbed system. So the conditions are quite technical, but on the other hand are explicit. So you do some calculation and you can decide uh, whether your perturbation is, uh, fits your theorem or not. And then uh, you are able to um, prove that there exist trajectories for which the action changes by some constant independent on epsilon, but you're also able to find some time estimates. So the estimate for, for diffusion in this case are uh, one over epsilon, ln of one over epsilon, and this has been co conjectured as optimal by uh, Ilo Schaff. So, um, so there is one uh, uh, so, so again, uh, you are able to find trajectories for which the action of the rotator changes by order one with respect to the perturbation. But you are able to find them in a time that is order epsilon, one over epsilon ln of one over epsilon. So you have some estimate on the diffusion time. There exists some. Yes. There exists some point here. Yes, so there exists a trajectory. Yes. No. Yes, so you are always able to find uh, uh, such a trajectory. And let me uh, point out that one of the assumptions that uh, is typically uh, considered is that uh, the unperturbed, the integrable Hamiltonian satisfies some twist condition. We do not assume that. So again, we are not particularly interested what is the specific dynamics here? All we need is area preserving. And then uh, just the idea of this theorem is the following. So uh, through, uh, you are able to, to show that there exists a open and dense set of, of perturbations for which there exists a homoclinic and corresponding scattering map as if you move along this scattering map, you are able to change order one. So if you may move order one by the scattering map, all you need for the inner dynamics, for the dynamics restricted to lambda, is to have recurrence. And the recurrence comes from uh, uh, Poincaré recurrence theorem. So you basically pay, no so this is quite uh, 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 different from other approaches. So there is a lot of work to understand if you have a twist map, 
what are the objects that organize the dynamics here. So you have CM theorem, you have uh, lower dimensional uh, elliptic islands, you have uh, uh, hyperbolic uh, periodic points and their stable and unstable manifold, and one can uh, sp uh, spend a lot of time to understand, to do estimates on these uh, geometric objects and uh, find out that uh, you can use them in order to travel. But with, with this lemma, you really need to understand that there is a direction in which the scattering map helps you to change the action variable by a lot, and then you use only the recurrence in the inner dynamics, in the dynamics restricted to lambda. So, uh, so if you can give me just uh, maybe two more minutes, then I can uh, uh, explain kind of informally uh, the idea for, uh, for proving that in the uh, time periodic perturbations of the geodesic flow, you can find trajectories whose energy goes to infinity in time. So uh, first of all, um, you, you find uh, geometric objects that organize the dynamics, and these are normally hyperbolic invariant manifolds, homoclinic orbits, and scattering maps, and these are the concepts that were described before. So you find that in the unperturbed uh, geodesic flow, they are already these objects. Then you consider the perturbation by a potential, and by some uh, rescaling, you are able to, to write the perturbed geodesic flow as a small and slow perturbation of the original geodesic flow. And uh, then you try to describe the dynamics via uh, with so-called so -called elementary building blocks. So you take uh, pieces of homoclinic orbits corresponding to a scattering map and pieces of the inner dynamics. And the idea is uh, you want to be able to say that first you compute what is the uh, so you follow uh, homoclinic orbit for some uh, finite time, and then you follow the inner dynamics for some finite time. You prescribe these times very carefully, and you compute what is the change of energy along such an elementary building block. So an elementary building block gives you essentially two orbits, a homoclinic orbit and an orbit in the dynamics restricted to lambda. So now the problem is that if you uh, follow uh, the scattering map corresponding to a single homoclinic, you may not be able to uh, consistently grow the energy of the system. But uh, as we have seen from the uh, Smale-Birchhoff theorem, if you have one homoclinic, you f find at least another one. So uh, generically, the change of energy by using a homoclinic and choosing the other homo homo homoclinic uh, have to be different. If not, you do a small perturbation. And then uh, uh, the you use the homoclinic that is more advantageous for you. So if a homoclinic gives you a better growth of energy, you use that one as much as you can. And maybe at some point, so this also depends on the external dynamical system on the flow on this external manifold. So maybe you are in some region of the external uh, dynamical system where you cannot pick the homoclinic that uh, uh, gives you a better growth of energy. So you choose to, to sort of repeat the same scattering map over and over again until you return to uh, the place where you can keep growing the energy. And you need to have uh, bounded return times for the external dynamical system because you want to uh, spend um, similar amount of time when you keep using this homoclinic that gives you more energy and when you use the other one. So, so this is basically the idea. You construct, you make these choices basically at every single step. So you apply the scattering map and uh, the inner dynamics and uh, make a choice which homoclinic will give you a better energy growth. And uh, you do this again and again. And the recurrence. So, so that you have a bound, so that the progress you made is a bound loop. Right? Yes, so exactly. Loop. Yes. So the, so you do estimates. There is some computation which is involved that tells you that if you lose, uh, you lose at the uh, subdominant order with respect to epsilon. 
And then uh, you repeat this over and over again. You, and at the end of the day, you apply the shadowing lemma from before, which tells you that if you have pseudo orbits like that, they are true orbits. And uh, I guess I am going to stop here. So in the a priori stable case, um, uh, I, I, so it's again, I should emphasize this is work in progress. So um, you look at single resonances uh, associated to the system and um, uh, uh, people are able to prove that associated to single resonances, you, you can find uh, normally hyperbolic invariant cylinders. And these normally hyperbolic invariant cylinders, uh, uh, one has the hope to prove that they, are, they have some regularity. I think uh, the current state of the art is that uh, uh, they are somewhat crumpled, so they have some bad regularity. But uh, uh, the hope is that using uh, some better uh, averaging methods, one can prove that they have enough regularity in order to, to apply this, this mechanism. So, so what we uh, hope to prove is that you can move order one along a single resonance. And through this mechanism, we are not uh, uh, trying to go any farther than that as uh, other people like Professor Mother and Aloy Shindu, namely to move from a single resonance go through a double resonance, move another single resonance, and so on. So uh, the hope is that uh, proving the existence of uh, regular normally hyperbolic invariant cylinders and applying uh, this shadowing lemma, you can find orbits for which the action changes are the one. Use the resonance to, to to find that you can get into a situation which is very Find similar to that. Yes. And the the big advantage of of uh, of this result is that uh, all you need to do it's in. Y y I mean, one of the problems in uh, is that the angle at which the stable and unstable manifolds can be uh, very small. So here, as long as you are able to find a direction in which the action variable makes progress, since you do not need to know the details of the inner dynamics, uh, the hope is that you are able to keep moving like that. But uh, I should uh, emphasize it's a work in progress. Thank you.